Want to know what people think when they buy something? We assume to think we know our customers. In reality, our customers are just like us and purchase our products for the same reasons we decided to make or sell them. You can shape a customer's vision and positively affect and manage the entire buying journey of a customer. Tune in to Dominate Your Market podcast as shares how businesses should look outside their internal ideas about selling something and see how customers buy. Witness how you will have a better understanding of customer motivation and avoid some common pitfalls. I want to welcome you all to the very first episode of the Dominate Your Market podcast. Today's guest is quite impressive. He is Martin Lewis. Martin was the only contributor to my book, Dominate Your Market. His chapter is titled, Get in the Minds of Your Customers. Martin, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. I am so excited to have you on because what you do for a living, I think, is so massive for every freaking company out there. And I think so many people are doing it wrong. I, I couldn't agree more. It's my passion. And after many, many years of sales and marketing, um, I won't say I've got it right, but I, I now see things from a totally different perspective just by looking at how customers buy so quitting the focus on how we sell and market reversing around and saying so how do customers buy surely we should understand that yeah i think that's amazing i want to i want to let our listeners know a little bit about your background you spent 40 years working in and thinking about sales and marketing 40 that's about so we're probably going to be pushing the same age you've worked in 33 countries i cannot say that that's wow holy crap and you've trained over 85,000 salespeople. Uh, I don't know how one guy can do that, but you're, you're, I guess you, there's probably a red S underneath your shirt called Superman, something like that. Uh, well, I didn't train all those 85,000 people personally. Uh, I've been in front of about half that number, but I've got a great team here that, that take our stuff out and deliver it. And I, I do know you have a team. So uh, yeah, I don't think, the, the way you're spreading the gospel out there, I don't think you could all do it by yourself because, gosh, there is only 24 hours in a day. You do have a life. So I think you would have to have a team. Exactly. But there are 24 hours a day in a day. So let's use them, right? It, it, exactly. So so tell me, what's going on with you right now? Do, are you do, any big projects, anything fun going on? What's going on with you right now? Uh, well, uh, I think there always is, you know, because helping companies with this exact thing is it what it, it, it's what turns me on. So we're helping a number of companies at the moment from startups to industry giants uh, in terms of how they approach the market. We've also got a very exciting relationship going over the last nine months or so with a technology company called Seismic, which I believe is really enabling people to grasp hold of the future and really do sales and marketing in a different way. That, well, so that you get, so typical you, you have a lot on your plate. Uh, yeah, but that keeps it fun, right? Keeps you young. Yeah, for sure. You know, another thing I want our listeners to know, too, is that you are the author of two amazing books, two incredible books, Sales Wise and How Customers Buy and Why They Don't. Now, that if that title doesn't get people curious, then, then it's game over. They should probably just get off listening, go listen to another podcast, because that title right there is enough to uh, to get people to think right there. Exactly. So, you know, there it is. How yes. Customers hey, why don't. is that color very similar? Yeah. Mine's a, mine's yeah, a little bit brighter. Right. You're a little bit more neon than I am. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, it's that 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 magnetic energy that I that I give off, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's see, it's the the, the 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 title was chosen very carefully because everybody knows why a customer should buy what they're offering. And this is really, really interesting and caught everything we do. Everybody from the business entrepreneur to the huge companies, they will all tell you why somebody should buy what they offer. That is the easy bit. It's the obvious bit. How somebody is going to buy it and why they don't is the tough bit. And to me, that is where we now are. Buyers are buying very differently from how they used to 10, 20 years ago. It's a different, different world. It's no longer about why somebody should buy what you're offering. It's about how they're going to buy it and very specifically why they may not. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think and that gets into consumer psychology, mindset, right? All of that. And I'm so, you know, as my book, my book covers a lot about mindset. 
for the for the CEO, the business owner, right? That that's what the book was written for. But I think for you, what you do really truly is incredible because if if we as business owners and and we own companies, we sell products, we sell services. If we don't understand the how of it, well, then we're going to be struggling all the time. What we're going to be doing is we're going to try, we're going to be always convincing people of why they should buy. Convincing. If somebody's talking to you, they already know that. They wouldn't be talking to you if they didn't believe there was a reason why they should buy what you're offering. Like I said, that's the easy bit. And yet that is where so many people get hung up. If you look at all our sales and marketing, it's all trying to convince somebody about why they should buy it. If they're interested, they know why they should buy it. Right. It's about how and why they shouldn't or why they wouldn't. So, so, so tell me then, where do you see the business is making the biggest mistake when it comes to selling and marketing? Where, where, are they, where are they really screwing up? Let's just, let's rip the bandaid off, throw the salt in the wound and let's go. And you know, you're right because this is going to hurt. The biggest issue is people love their own offering. And no, it's not as good as you think it is. <laughs> Sorry to tell I love you, it. <laughs> but we've, we've talked to thousands of buyers. We're yet to find any buyer that says, hey, they were the only game in town, right? So you are not as differentiated as you think you are. And customers don't have such a huge, compelling reason to buy what you've got. Sorry, that's the way it is. Now, why is that like ripping the Band-Aid off? Who wants to work for a company where we say, well, our product isn't that great? Everybody wants to work for a company where, or own a company or start a company where they believe in their product. They believe their product is so great, great, only a fool wouldn't buy it. And there is the biggest problem. There are so many fools out there, you would not believe it. So you've got to get beyond the love of product. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't have passion for your product. Of course you should, but it has to go much further. You have to really understand the cold reality. It's not about your product. So, so when you have these harsh discussions with, with clients, probably, right, are these very, very, I'm sure they get somewhat emotional, maybe, right? Oh, you're right. Yes. Yeah. In fact, we'll, we'll walk in with what I hope is deep and robust research, which shows that these are the reasons people aren't buying your product. This is how they rate your product in terms of others. This is all the alternative things they can do, including doing nothing. Oh, that's and amazing. Often, and, and I hope we walk in the room with very robust uh, research. And that's the voice of the customer. That's not us, that's the market. Every time people say, but you don't understand. And they rush out of the room, they go get their product. Let us demonstrate this. Let me show you this. Let me tell you about what this other doctor said. And they're trying to sell their product to us. We see that so many times when they tell us, you don't understand our product is great. And we're saying, no, this is what the market is saying. So when you when you have that little bit of a pushback like that, right? Or it could be a big pushback, whatever. So, and you've got all this research that you brought into the, to the meeting. So where, how does that meeting go from, do people, do the majority of your clients, obviously they're paying you lots of money because you are the man. I'm bowing down to you right now. So do they do they open up a little bit? And do they want to listen? Or do you get some clients that continue to say, no, I don't think you get it? It, it happens rarely. It happens rarely yeah. that, that they don't get it. But yes, we usually have that emotional response. And then people start to think about it. I was in a meeting with, a multi-billion dollar medical distribution company. And the president was in the room. And he was the one that said, wait a minute, wait a minute. So this explains what's going on in our market. He said, for the last five or seven years, we've tried to understand what's happening in our market. And we've never really got to it. He said, if we can just listen to this and understand what the customer is saying, so this tells us what's happening. And then, of course, people, once you get past that, people go, well, OK, now, if we really understand how customers are buying and why they may not be, we can address that. We can get past just pushing product at them. We can get past trying to prove how valuable our product is. We can get past that and we can address the real concerns. We can really engage in that marketplace in an effective manner. Well, you know, th that's interesting. Well, and I love that, that that president saw it, right? It's like he saw the writing on the wall. He's like, wait a minute, we've been going five or seven years. This isn't working. 
and you come in with your your, your research and they're, he's like this this is what we need so you know it's interesting you know when i consult with a lot of my ceo clients a lot of them are very fearful of change oh yes very very fearful of change right and, and i'm sure with you these I, I i wish i could say i, I consult with ceos that run billion dollar companies i don't <laughs> mine mine are substantially smaller than that but uh but you know i i would imagine that as the companies get larger do you feel a sense of like in that room let's say you've got 10 c suites people 10 c suite people in that room would do you feel a sense of tension in the room and when when it comes to you're presenting something and really they need to make a change yes right and you know the irony of that on the topic of change they're all asking their customers or prospects to change when they buy their product there it is. Isn't this that is crazy. The, this is one of the big ironies I see that oh. we're all buyers. So do we buy in the way that people imagine people are going to buy their offering? No, we don't. Right. We buy in the way that people buy. And you've got to open your eyes to that. People don't buy because you come in and say, hey, my offering represents this value to you. But if you spend 10 bucks with me, you're going to get $15 back. And somebody says, quick, give me the checkbook. That is not how people buy. And yet we imagine that's how people are going to buy our product. So, yes. So the irony of that is you say that people are reluctant to change. Yes, they are. And when we're bringing new products and services to the marketplace, we're asking people to change. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting because I think when depending on the personality of people sitting in that room, age, age difference, whatever that may be, I think some people are just very resistant to any kind of change in their life. But you know, when I when I have calls and, and and talks with my CEO clients, a lot of times I'll ask them, well, put yourself in their shoes. Put yourself through that process. How would you feel? How would you make that decision? And they go, and the, that's a very basic strategy, right? But they go, I've never thought about it like that. Because they're so in the weeds. They're so, you know, and they're under a lot of pressure and all those things. But I think, you know, human nature says, well, wait a minute, let me just step back for a minute. How do I buy something? And if you can, if you can kind of circle that back onto you, how you do it yourself as a human, not as a CEO or as a this or as a that, but how do I as a human buy? That gets right down to that core, doesn't it? Exactly. How do I buy? And what's my tolerance to change? Because uh, like to just to pick up my mobile phone here, right? Do we change every time somebody comes out with a better phone and a better wireless plan? No, we don't. No. Nope. Right. And yet, if you look at the advertising and marketing from the companies, you'd think oh. that we would because they're advertising, hey, you're going to make these cost savings. Well, do we change our carrier every few weeks because somebody's got a better plan? No, we don't. No, nope. no. Nope. You know, I want to cover something. So in the chapter you wrote in my book, which was just a phenomenal chapter, and I'm so thankful that you wrote that chapter and you are the only contributed in that entire book. So that's pretty cool. Thank you. But you, you you had a section in there. You called it the market engagement crisis. God, that just jumped that those words in my in my own book jumped off that page. I thought, ooh, I want him to talk about that. So, so kind of explain what you mean by that and how that's well, affecting you know companies and uh, people you work with. Well the market engagement is really how do we engage with our bias? Right. Okay. And the crisis is we're doing such a terribly lousy job of doing that. I'm going to come back to what we we're saying just a moment ago. If we look at most sales and marketing, most of the investments we make are all about telling people how great our product is, oh, what yeah. the value of it is, how life is going to be so great if you buy or acquire our product or service. That is not how buyers are buying. So we've got this huge gap between companies trying to convince the marketplace of their product and buyers doing things very, very differently. So we've got this gap, and I, I believe it's a crisis because you go to companies and you ask them, what is your market engagement strategy? What's your sales strategy? How do you engage in the marketplace? And I'm gonna guarantee in most situations, you're gonna get blank stares, or you're gonna be told about marketing campaigns or selling approaches, whatever. In very, very, very few cases, is anybody going to articulate what I call a market engagement strategy? Here's how we engage with our buyers. Here's how we stay relevant to those buyers. Here's how we help those buyers. Here's how we deliver value to these buyers. 
Here's how we ensure that their experience after buying is good and they recommend us to others and they'll buy again from us. That is a strategy. And every company, I believe, should have what I call a market engagement strategy, clearly, clearly stating who their market is, how they engage in the buying journey, how they stay relevant in the buying journey, how do they help and how do they possibly impact that buying journey as a buyer is going through it? What do they do then after sale? What do they do to ensure that that customer has, has the experience they want? That, to me, is a market engagement strategy. And in most cases, it is totally missing. It's just let's go and tell everybody how great our product is. That's the market engagement crisis. Well, I love market engagement strategy. That That is, woo, because I'm right in the middle of that with a couple of my CEOs right now consulting with them. Exactly that thing where th there's no process, there's no documentation, there's no system in place. It's literally just kind of shooting from the hip. The sales sure. guys aren't talking. It's just a crazy environment out there. And I think you, if you don't have a, found, a sound strategy and have it documented, right? I mean, so that yeah, it literally totally. is on, on, pardon the pun, I hate to say it's because it's 2022, but on paper, right? Yeah. Like I, I, I'm a firm believer that in the CRO, VP of sales office, VPs and marketing office, it's not the CEO's office, they should have that on the wall. Yes. They should say, here's how we engage with our marketplace. Here's how we engage with them. This is what we talk about. This is how we're relevant. This is the value we deliver. This is how we navigate and support our buyers through their lifetime cycle with us. And it can, we, we create charts of that. And then everything you do in marketing, in sales, in service, in support, in value realization, Every that touches a customer should be aligned to that strategy. And really, everybody should have buy-in in the entire company, shouldn't they? Totally. Everybody. Totally. I mean, it's, that's almost a. Totally. It's almost like a. That's almost like an extended mission statement kind of thing, right? It, it absolutely is. And, and we did this with a, a, a multi-billion-dollar technology company. We did exactly that, and they took that back through the entire organization, even to their legal department. So how does legal support our frontline people? When did they get involved? What value do they bring? What mm. can we expect from them? So they actually interlock their entire organization behind their engagement strategy. That, that's, that's incredible. You know, it's so funny. That, that goes along the same lines as when I consult with a client. Um, as you know, many of them sell the features. Many of them sell, sell their company. Like, you know, we are X. And I've got some of my clients now with yellow stickies and this, I, I, the words, sell the solution. Sell the solution. Don't sell Absolutely. your company. Don't sell your product. Sell the solution to your ideal customer. And, yeah. and that's that simple kind of mindset shift that everybody in the company needs to understand so that if, if they're out and about even, right? And people just say, you know, well, what do you do? Well, oh, Absolutely. we're this company. Well, no, I mean, how about state the solution? Oh, you know, we help companies attain this or achieve that or whatever it may be. That's a lot more impacting than just stating, you know, oh, we, we do this. Absolutely. I'll I, I tell you a, a short story that hopefully snaps us to focus. And I think it's kind of fun. Uh, we do a lot of work in B2B and some B2C. And uh, an orthopedic surgery center asked us to get involved and look at their their buying journey and how they could better market because people were marketing various hip replacements and things like this using various techniques and things. And they were looking at how could they market differently? So like many orthopedic surgery centers and hospitals, they were advertising, they had big billboards of their surgeons and they actually, uh, I think they were third in the country ranked on their, their, their surgery techniques and their mm. outcomes and things. So they, they had something to shout about. So they had billboards, showing their surgeons in their scrubs and things and talking about how they've rated third in the country and all this kind of stuff. And we looked at it. So we looked at, so how do people buy a surgeon to do a hip replacement or a knee or joint replacement, right? And it's a really interesting buying journey because people actively try not to buy. They don't want surgery. So they'll drag yeah. their legs around <laughs> Yeah. behind them for several <laughs> years before they have surgery, right? So yeah. they do everything they can not to have surgery. They're not buying surgery. They'll do acupuncture. They'll do physiotherapy. They'll strap their legs up. They'll do all sorts of things <laughs> to avoid surgery. And then how do they buy? How do they choose a surgeon? Well, we found in this case that in most situations, the buyers had been dragging their legs around for a year or two 
and they would have dinner with a friend, a relative, or somebody perhaps they'd never met before. And the person would say, wow, I was just like you. And then I went to Doc Jones. He is fantastic. you got to go to Doc Jones. Man, I was playing tennis within six weeks. I had a little bit of pain, but nothing I couldn't deal with. It was just fantastic. And you know what they do? They go to Doc Jones. Now, what's strange about that? What is really strange is they've suddenly made the decision to have surgery because somebody they may never have met before has given them that recommendation. What credentials does that person have to make that recommendation? They've only ever had one joint replacement. So they've got no Ooh, comparative analysis. Point. They've got no medical training whatsoever. So they have no idea, no idea. And yet you are making your decision based on that. So that's a fascinating thing to understand. Huh. And then you look at it and you say, okay, so you are an orthopedic surgery center. That is not what people want. They don't want surgery. So we rebranded them as a health joint restoration clinic. Restoration, Ooh, and I like it. Want, and so gone were the posters of people playing, uh, people, um, the surgeons, and they, they redid that with pictures of people playing tennis. <laughs> That's so the outcome. To your point, people want to be healthy and start doing athletics and having their life back. They don't want surgery. Yes. And then the other thing that happens is what we did with them is connect with your buyers earlier. Don't try and connect yep. with them when they decide to have surgery. Connect with them when they first got a pain. Yep. If they want, if they want, and if it's suitable for acupuncture or physiotherapy, do that. Build the relationship with them. Then when the time comes for surgery, you will have that relationship with them. You can be a trusted source for them. So with them, we did the two things. We switched the whole focus from surgery to healthy lifestyle, and we got them engaged with their customers earlier in the journey. Don't wait till they've made the decision to have surgery. It's too late. Get involved with them when they first have a joint pain. So that's kind of, I think, a cute story. I love that. I love that. Why it matters to understand how buyers buy and why they don't. Well, you know, and I think a lot of companies, they don't realize it, realize this. And this is in my book, by the way statistics show that only 3% of people are ready to buy now. 3%. Yep. That's it. Yep. Yep. 97% of the people you talked about, get them in early, treat them, educate them, provide value, take care of them. Because I think a lot of people don't understand that when you look at uh, the buying cycle, let's say, right? The length of a buying cycle, everybody wants to run ads and spend money to get to people to pull the trigger right now. Well, a hip replacement, now you've got insurance that may cover it, but that's very extensive. It's very invasive. It could be life-changing, pro mm. or con, right? Yeah. So people are not going to make that decision by landing on a website or seeing an ad, ever, mm. ever. And, and the, when you, they're in a buying cycle, it happens like that. So like my example, it's kind yep. of an interesting example, when people decide to have surgery, well, they decide to have surgery, they're going to see Doc Jones. Yep. So there's only an instant. So yes, you are not marketing to people who are in that imaginary state of looking around in the market thinking, oh, what can I do with my time and money? Yep. That is not, that, that is mythical. Well, and you know, the story you tell, I, I, want, I want to explain to the listeners one thing. That person who heard the other person say, I was playing tennis in six weeks and blah, 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 all this stuff. The, the, the individual that ends up pulling the trigger saying, I want to do it, they do it on emotion. That was an emotional decision. That was not logical. That was not factual. That was not research and all these things. They heard another person tell a story about their surgery and how it turned out amazing. And emotionally, they got connected to that and said, I'm doing it. And that is how decisions are made around millions of dollar acquisitions in business to business. Yep. Um, it is not logical. Mm -hmm. If people think that people buy logically, uh, well, first of all, study behavioral economics. That will tell you very that people do not behave logically. Yep. But oddly enough, they do behave predictably. You can predict how people are going to react. Oh, sure. Respond. But it's not logical. They yep. don't say, oh, wow, here's a chance for us to say, 10% on our phone bills or whatever it is, let's sign up. They don't behave logically. Mm -mm. No, no. It, it, that, that's a part of human psychology that just fascinates me. 
it just is it's so fascinating but um hey i want to get on to the next topic and it's kind of cool but what do you think can make the difference between in the terms of companies going to market when you think of go to market right and everybody is launching new products new services and all these different things but what can make the biggest difference for companies that are in that stage right that go to market stage talk about that a little bit in that early stage yes um it's it's going out and finding how the customers are going to buy this this is this is returning to that same thing but at that early stage the disease of loving your product is probably at its highest <laughs> you are really excited. Excited. i almost choked, choked on my water is it as, as you know as you should be you're really excited uh we worked with a, a company that was bringing a new uh, medical device to the marketplace and th this medical device was surely going to help patients potentially save lives, uh, reduce costs. So they were enthusiastic about it as they should be. They'd spent a lot of money, got a lot of patents, done a lot of clinical trials. It was coming to market. We got involved at that very early stage and we looked at various markets they could bring this device into and the top two markets they were looking at, we were going, you know, it, the timing isn't right. It, it is, uh, yes, the benefits are there, but the timing isn't right to take this device into that market. So we, they, they say we save them considerable money Ooh. and time in finding that out by trial and error. If we hadn't done that market research, if we hadn't looked at how customers buy up front, they would have hired salespeople. They would have been out there spreading the great word. They would have been digging in the wrong place. That was not the best place to launch that product. So, so you, very, very careful analysis of markets and, and segmentation of markets to really understand how a market is going to um, react to, respond to, and acquire a particular product. How often do you think early stage companies do that exact big mistake right there? How often? Oh, they, I, they rarely do it. They'll do focus groups um, yep. and things like that maybe, but most of that is confirmation bias. Even we don't believe in focus groups unless you're selling to a focus group. If you're selling to a focus group, a focus group is a great person to go and ask. If but if you're, you're not selling, selling to a focus group, don't don't go ask a focus group. Uh, but the number of people that that really do deep market research to understand how a customer would buy. Now, sure, they'll look at uh, doing some market testing of features and functions of products. Um, but then really understand the emotion and predicting what's going to happen when that market goes out, when that product goes into the marketplace, I think there's a huge void. And I've seen it again and again and again. And then the surprise is there when you don't get the traction you're expecting, either the initial traction or you take the low hanging fruit. We worked with a, a great company in San Diego and they had had sales, they had VC money going in and their sales curve was going like this. And their VC of sales had the, the vision and guts to go, wait a minute, we've picked the low hanging fruit. We've now got revenue targets going up and we've picked the right low hanging fruit. We're at a low hanging fruit. It's now going to start getting tough. We need to better understand our market. That took guts to do that, but yep. he was right on, right on. So there you go. Went out, carefully dissected the market, looked at, okay, how are our customers going to buy? Where is the best market and how, what's our engagement strategy? So, so, so tell me um, as we wrap this up. So let's say all the, you work with a lot of big companies. I know you work with startups as well. So you, you, you kind of cover that whole range, but for, for, you know, let's say a company, you know, 5 million to 20 million, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Like what kind of advice would you give them? Let's say their sales have stagnated. Let's yeah. say their sales and marketing is not grooving together. Right. Which yeah. is very yeah. common. Right. Yeah. Now we see that I see that all the time with my CEO clients all the time. What would, what advice would you give them? Um, and I'm obviously at the end of this, I'm going to give people your contact information, websites, and I hope they go buy your books because your books are incredible. But what would you just in wrapping this up? What would you say to them? Like, what could they do? Even that you know, might not be a full scale effort. What could they do? Well, uh, thanks for that, Mike. And the first thing is. I would say that they're not alone. You already said it. A lot of companies in that that size are, are, are finding that traction is hard. Growth is hard. So you're not alone. That's a very common. The good news is you can act very quickly. Being that size, you can change things almost overnight. Mm. 
So I'm going to go back to, you've got to look at the strategy. The number one thing you can do is go out and find out how your customers are buying. Don't ask about features and functions. Don't ask what they like about the products or what they like about the competition. Go and ask them, how did you buy? Right, And uh, you've got customers. And in fact, bet still, go and talk to people that have maybe gone away or didn't buy from you and ask just for 15 minutes of their time. Ask them to take you through what happened behind the scenes. And I would use those exact words. Yep. Ask them, hey, we really want to understand You'd be doing us a huge favor. We want to understand. We want to gain insight from you. If you could just tell us what happened. Tell us the story. What started and what happened? Who got involved? How did you make the decisions? Do not be judgmental. Do not try. And this is tough. Do not try and push your product. Say, well, you could have known or you should have. None of that. Listen. Listen very carefully to what they say. What happened? What did they do? Who got involved? What were they looking for? What were their concerns? What, what were they concerned about? And, and then how do they make the decisions they made? And listen and listen questions. carefully. And, and we've already said it may not sound logical, but it's going to, you're going to hear the same story over and over again. It is predictable. Understand what's going on behind the scenes as your customers or your prospects are going through their buying journey. That, that, you know, those questions you just said were amazing, like perfect questions. So hopefully people listening, take those notes when you get to this part, when you listen to it, because those questions were amazing. But, you know, to, to add to that one final thought for me, I always ask the clients to find out what the trigger moment was, what the trigger was, right? You know, because everybody has a trigger, right? People don't take action until something triggers in them. Yeah. That psych- psychology wise. And, and, you know, and I used to be a private fitness trainer for 20 years, a long time ago. Um, and I still do fitness seven days a week now. So that's a whole nother story. But, but you know, some people, you know, uh, I'll give you an example. Somebody is a, a gentleman's 50 pounds overweight, really big, big, big guy. And he knows it, but he hasn't really dealt with it. He hasn't been real with himself about it, which I talk in my book in chapter one. Uh, look in the mirror and accept what, what you got and deal with it. But the bottom line is that, like that gentleman, let's say he saw a picture at a family outing and it was from behind and he looked like a big walrus, right? And, and that moment for him was a trigger. Yep. And he was like, oh my God, look at me, look yep. at that. And that it, you hear stories you know, in the weight loss industry, you hear stories like that all the time where they saw a picture and typically that's what it is. They yep. saw a picture and pictures don't lie. I'm sorry, folks, but they don't lie. And that's that's what I would call those trigger moments, right? Would you agree with that? Triggers. Yeah. T- in fact, we call it triggers. And that's a great way to start the conversation. Ask about experience, activity, what happened to start this. And then, yeah, tell uh, then ask them, tell the story. What happened next? That's a great way to start this conversation. What what started you even thinking about this? Okay, what happened next? Who was involved? And then those are the questions I said. So yeah, we totally believe in those triggers. So right on. Awesome. Martin, you are amazing. You kick, you are, you are the first episode kicking off my business podcast. So I'm Excellent. so so glad to have you on. So if people loved all your information, which I'm sure they did, and they want to find out about you, what's what are LinkedIn, website URLs, where do you want them to go? Yeah. So first thing is, I'm always, as you may tell, I'm always excited to talk to people about this topic. It's passionate. The more people I talk to, the I more I tell. learn. So please do let me know what you think. Contact me on LinkedIn, Martin Lewis um, with a Y or M Lewis, one word, M-L-E-W-I-S at market-partners.com, market-partners.com or LinkedIn, Martin Lewis, Market Partners. Thanks, Mike. It's been a real pleasure. Martin, thank you so much and have a great day. You've just listened to the Dominate Your Market podcast with CEO, business consultant, and author, Michael Peterson. Growth-minded CEOs hire Michael to explode their revenues, build an amazing company, and create a transformational mindset that encapsulates growth, success, and ultimately, happiness. His book, Dominate Your Market, is creating quite a stir in the marketplace. Go to dominateyourmarketbook.com and get your first chapter free.